When exactly did Jesus die? Is the glory of God revealed through shame? How is the resurrection a new beginning? Welcome to Horizons of Scripture, a biblical studies podcast with me, Elizabeth Corser, and me, Charlie Hajif. So, this is our fourth podcast. We've yeah. survived so far. We have, we have. It's going well. <laughs> And we started with a Christmas special, and it's now Easter. I know, I know, I can't believe it. Although I suppose we, we won't call that an Easter special, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> so by the time this comes out, you will be, will be in the third term, right? Yeah, yeah. we'll be in the third, third teaching term, so... Um, so what are you doing? Uh, uh, canonical readings of Scripture. Um, so we're looking at the theme of grace throughout the, the biblical canon, so... Um, an appropriate topic for for this podcast. So. Oh, very good. Yeah, we should maybe do at some point uh, a series on canonical. Um, I mean, I, last term I did biblical interpretation, which mm. which did uh, uh, historical and reader oriented uh, reading. So maybe we can do we can do a few series on that at some yeah. point. Yeah. Uh, but today we're going to talk about the cross and the resurrection. Yeah. And it is a special podcast because uh, we have a guest with us. Um, yeah, we have uh, Jeremy Duff with us, the principal at, at St. Padarn. So and it's it's not actually Jeremy Duff; it's the Jeremy Duff, as I'm told. So, um, oh, right. <laughs> the one and only. The one and only. Oh. That's right. Yeah, I'm so. sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we uh, yeah, we will need to talk. We'll we'll do a separate one on on the elements of the New Testament Greek, Jeremy. I think not, <laughs> that will be. Uh, that will be a fun one to do. Uh, uh, absolutely. Well, there's a new edition will be out in a year or so, so we could have a little uh, little launch yeah. podcast. Yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely, we'll do that. But because Jeremy is the principal, so he's he's our boss. Uh, I'll I'll be I'll be on my best behavior. Yes, uh, absolutely. This time I know you are always on your best behavior. But, well, I uh, try. I try, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> but Jeremy, do you want to say something uh, to introduce yourself a bit more uh, apart from the? Jeremy Duff. <laughs> yes, so it's, it's strange how you can be defined by one book you wrote 20 years ago, isn't it? But um, yes, so I'm Jeremy, principal at St. Paddens, um, background in New Testament studies, um, and then in church ministry, particularly in areas of um, urban deprivation, and then came across here to Wales about seven years ago. Well, um, yeah, and um, I'm the principal, that's great, I'm keeping the tutors and students in order. Um, <laughs> keeps them busy. Seven years, a perfect number. Yeah. That's absolutely perfection. <laughs> no, it's eight years, actually. Eight, eight years. Oh. This first, well, seven years still. Eight years on St. David's Day. Um, oh. Very good. An auspicious day to, to start. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> I started well. I mean, it's, you know. So uh, maybe we can we can spend uh, the, the the cross and the resurrection is such a huge topic. So mm. we won't cover uh, we won't try and cover everything, but we'll focus on a few uh, interesting details. Um, and maybe we can uh, in the first half we can do the cross, and then we can move on to the uh, resurrection. So um, I mean, with 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 the with the cross, we have uh, the, the well known story in the synoptics of Jesus. Uh, uh, takes the disciples for the Last Supper, and there are the words of the institution. Uh, John doesn't have that, uh, though, does he? Um, that's that's an interesting uh, mm. uh, difference between the two traditions. So. Yeah, yeah. John, in John, we we have um, the the first half of the gospel. Jesus is undertaking his public ministry, um, and then in the second half, we see jo uh, Jesus uh, taking his disciples aside um, and offering them private instruction, private teaching. Um, and it's at the beginning of the second half that we have this foot washing scene, um, which in many ways um, replaces um, Mark's uh, Last Supper scene, or Matthew or Luke's as well. Um, we, we've got sort of the, the idea of Judah is going to be the betrayer in there. Um, we've got um, the bread dipping, um, but we don't actually um, have the, the breaking or, or the sharing of the bread that we have um, in, in the Synoptic Gospels. And what we do have that's interesting, though, is in sort of the unique Jonine um, signs 
um, material, we've got uh, the bread of life. And at that point in, in John's gospel, there's an introduction of Jesus saying, you know, whoever eats my flesh, drinks my blood, um, will be the one who has um, eternal life. So there is certainly sort of a, a sort of Eucharistic idea found in John. It's just not um, in the the passion narrative in the Last Supper that we, we find it in, in the Synoptics. So. And I think that's what we get with John overall. He tends to have fewer incidents and expound them at far greater length and draws out the sort of theological meaning of the incident mm. in a way that it doesn't happen. The synoptics tend to be almost telling you what you'd have seen at the time and just packing in the incidents. So the fact, so, I mean, John does have Jesus with the disciples the night before he was betrayed. But instead of telling you lots of things that happened, you get Jesus, a big block of Jesus teaching, explaining it. But it certainly is interesting that, as Elizabeth says, it, we've got Eucharistic stuff elsewhere in John, but what he chooses as his one incident to then expand is the foot washing. So it's almost like John is uh, uh, looking at all the stuff he could have expounded from that night. Um, he, you know, he's going to choose one and make it and expound it a lot. It's interesting that's what he chose. Um, he wants us to see the the story through that lens the one uh, i think talking about theology the one uh, theme in john that i have always found uh, fascinating is this idea of, of glory uh, and the fact that the cross uh, reveals the glory of jesus and and the glory of god and you have a lot of uh, i mean you have a concentration of that in in chapter 12 just before the the foot washing uh, where Jesus says uh, the Son of Man will be lifted up and then his glory will be revealed. And there are a couple of very interesting quotes from uh, from Isaiah. So there you have a quote both from Isaiah 6, where Isaiah sees uh, the Lord standing on the, uh, on the throne and the glory fills the temple, so a very uh, powerful uh, vision. And then you have a quote from Isaiah 53, uh, the famous uh, last uh, servant song. And kind of those quotes tie uh, the whole of the book of Isaiah into the uh, the cross in some way, suggesting that the glory Isaiah saw in, in chapter 6 in the temple has been revealed in the servant song and then will be revealed uh, in the cross. And I've always found that fascinating. I think particularly because when you look at the cross, it's not uh, it's not necessarily a very glorious picture. I mean, you have a... A, a, a naked, beaten body uh, lifted on a stick. People deride uh, and, and go by. So uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that and in terms of the way that works uh, in, in the John narrative. Uh, Elizabeth is the expert on John, but I just want to sort of pause slightly the thought that this is um, uh, unique in John. Because I, I think if you go back to Mark's gospel, um, I think you do see you do see this happening, and I, I would say this is where you know John has then again taken it and expounded it at more depth. Because in Mark's gospel, people often don't notice, but if you ask the question, when does a human being for the first time call Jesus a son of God, the answer is yes, as he dies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that the reader was told at the beginning of Mark. Um, we hear it at the baptism and at the transfiguration. The demons shout it out, but no human being recognizes Jesus as the Son of God until he dies. And I think you see in that, um, certainly implicitly, you can argue forever about whether Mark meant it or not, but implicitly you see the fact that what is the glory of God? And the glory a, of God is not power, it's, it's suffering. It's ironically a Roman soldier, right, uh, who confesses it. Uh, uh, yeah. abso absolutely. So, so it's, it's again, a Gentile and a military. Uh, uh, quite. So the true glory of God is recognized not by the people who you'd think would recognize the glory of God, but also the glory of God is not recognized in the miracles. You know, in Mark's gospel, he's not yeah. declared to be the son of God when they see him walk on the water or calming the storm. That's what we think, that the glory of God is to be more powerful than any human being. But actually, Mark's narrative seems to set up, no, no, the glory, if you want to see what God is really like, you see a man dying on the cross. So I think, so that sense of, of sort of 
true divinity being seen on the cross, the glory of God, in that sense, being seen. Where do you see the glory of God? You see it at the cross. So the word glory and that exposition is there in John. But I, th- I think you, you, you got it there. You got, you got it being recognised, being hinted at, being sort of somewhere underlying what we have in the earliest gospel account. Mm. Mm, yeah. And I think to build on that, Jeremy, as you were saying, this idea of, I think John knows Mark. And I think John here, certainly he wants to, to take this further. And, you know, after Jesus' first uh, sign in the beginning of his public ministry, he revealed his glory. The disciples believed in him. So it is this idea that um, in Mark's gospel, um, glory was was there and was to be seen. It just is not drawn out as much as it then is by by John in, in his gospel. So. So John is an argument for us trying to look beneath the surface of texts. Yeah. As he does in a way with Mark, maybe. Yeah. And and John himself admits it. There's a number of points where John says, we only understood this after the Spirit was given. Absolutely. We only understood this afterwards. And so John himself admits that I think what you what you see in John, what what you get in the text of John is 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 the events plus what we what we came to understand was really going on. Yeah, and, and, and John is John is open about that. Yeah. I, I mean, drawing Mark into the discussion, what I find quite fascinating is the strong emphasis on humiliation and, uh, and the shame that Jesus experiences on the cross. And, and uh, that it's, it's in all the Gospels, of course, but uh, um, you, you have this narrative of people uh, passing by, ridiculing him, saying, if you're the son of God, get uh, down from the cross. Uh, you have in John, of course, as well, the the crown of thorns, the spitting, the mm-hmm. prophesy challenge and, and so on. Uh, and it, it does seem to be a very deliberate contrast between, on one hand, uh, the, the shame that uh, if you look at this as a purely uh, from a, as a purely human event, uh, the shame and degradation that is uh, portrayed. And on the other hand, looking beneath the surface of that, uh, the revelation of God's uh, glory. Mm-hmm. And I think actually it, it, it's again John who makes the point in, in chapter 12 that, uh, that those who rejected him were seeking the glory of human beings, not the glory of God. So yeah. he yeah. contrasts those two very different types of glory, one of which looks very much uh, like uh, humiliation. Um, and I, I wonder when we kind of look at the cross through that perspective, what does that tell us about the, the person of God and, and the, about theology more, more generally? Uh, if sh- human shame is actually the ultimate revelation of God's glory in that particular uh, event. Well, and I suppose your Christian, you, you know, Paul connects with that quite a bit, doesn't he, when he talks about, you know, he starts off Romans saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel um, and in Corinthians he'll talk about the the foolishness you know the cross is is a stumbling block to Jews the foolishness to the Greeks so that sense that there is something um, sort of all wrong about this uh, the world turned upside down is something that I think it's interesting that the early Christian writers they don't try to minimize they 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 they, they grab hold of as an important point uh, in a sense I mean, one thing that I, I was noticing when I was reading this was just one particular slant on shame is about the nakedness. Mm. Almost every crucifix you see in Christianity doesn't have a naked Jesus on it. It's very interesting. You know, one part of the church might have empty crosses. One part of the church has tends to have crosses with Jesus on it, but they won't be naked. You know, we can't actually depict the shame of it. Um, but the nakedness is interesting because that was the first response to human sin in Genesis 3. The yeah. very first thing is Adam and Eve hide and they say it's because we realized we were naked and we were ashamed. And they try to make clothes for themselves, but then when God meets with them, he clothes them. So I, I, I'm not quite sure where I go with that, but it's very, the, the idea, the connection of nakedness and shame and God providing a covering right there in Genesis 3 and at the cross, God entering into the nakedness as a way of almost depicting the entering into the shame. 
and I suppose there's a long, I mean, in the, in the letters and then a big tradition in Christianity about talking about us being clothed in Christ, us being clothed by Christ's righteousness. So the whole nakedness and God providing clothes for us. Um, and so Jesus entering the shame, even entering the nakedness. I think there is, uh, over the last few years, there's been a lot of talk about mental health, uh, hasn't there? And people kind of, uh, especially uh, a lot of students uh, struggle with mental health issues and, and so on. Uh, and I think a feeling of, of obviously isolation, alienation, and sometimes also maybe uh, struggle with self-esteem and shame is is part of that. So. It is a topic that that has uh, uh, many different kind of. You can take it in a number of different directions. I think uh, so. Maybe some good research can be done in in the contemporary relevance of some of that. So. Yeah. Did but sh- shall we talk about something else? The the. Yeah, we we've been talking a lot about um, the crucifixion of Jesus, but I think sort of the elephant in the room is that on what day did Jesus actually die? Because our, our gospel accounts don't, don't seem to agree um, on this. Um, Synoptics have him dying on the day of the Passover, but John has him on the day of, of preparation um, be, before the Passover. So there's a great debate about, well, which one is it? And, and can we actually um, pinpoint him? So does that mean... Synoptics got it right and John got it wrong, or it, it's a funny one. There was a there was a wonderful attempt in the nineteen fifties and sixties after the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls to try to say they're both right, mm. because there was a there was an argument within Judaism at the time about calendars, and some people using a solar calendar, but the, while the uh, um, while the temple. Um, used the um, lunar calendar, which became the dominant form in, in Judaism. Um, so there were attempts to try to say, haha, both are right because they're just both yeah. using different calendars, which I, th- I say with an amusing, because that, to me that's the, the sort of tempting but mistake in a way, is to try to find some way of saying, oh, they're, they're both right. Um, it seems to me, as Elizabeth said, that they both massively connected to the Passover. The whole thing is connected to the Passover and Jesus is the Passover lamb in all of them. But somehow the connection is being made slightly differently as to, you know, is the Last Supper the Passover or is Jesus' death at the time the Passover lamb died, which is John? Mm. You, you can't have... You can't have both. So, so I think it's really intriguing how you see the overwhelming, and Paul talks about Christ, our Passover lamb, as we say, you know, the, 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 the connection with the Passover is the dominant element, and we see a variation in the, the date. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my, my former supervisor, Helen Bond, has an interesting mm. article on this, and she talks about, you know, if, if in contemporary society we said, oh, you know, my my grandmother died at Christmas. It doesn't yeah. mean that she necessarily died on the 25th of December, mm-hmm. but rather she died during the Christmas period. So it's sort of tying in with that idea of, um, and sort of Helen brings in this idea of sort of memory and communal memories and how people remember things. And actually it's, yeah, do, do we know? He, he just died at the time of Passover, but the evangelists um, with their own traditions, with their own sort of writing communities took that in their own um in their own ways, and um. I think that's right, isn't it? That all the, the the work that's been done on on witnesses, eyewitnesses, Richard Borkham, I always think of mm, on that. Absolutely, really interesting that it shows that the oral or memory, really, that memory remembers the important things really well, but doesn't remember the things that at the time you didn't think were important. So. Um, I, if I asked you, you know, about a holiday, have you ever been to Greece? Did you have a great time on holiday in Greece? Lots of people will remember, oh, yes, well, there was this harbour and we had fish and whatever. And they can describe the meal they had. If I asked them what the date of it was, mm. they wouldn't remember at all because that, that, that wasn't what was important. Uh, and that's the way memory seems to work. You, it's not that it all gradually becomes vague. Mm-hmm. Lots of people um, say if they're married and you ask them about when they got engaged... They will be able to conjure up in a lot of detail exactly what was going on at that moment. Ask them what, what happened the following day. They don't remember at all. 
And so you remember, so, which isn't a way of sort of washing away the question, but what it actually shows really is the earliest Christians thought the connection with Passover was really important, mm -hmm. thought that various these key events of what happened was really important, but didn't see the date as that important, which is a pain because we would love to know. Yeah, exactly. So what, 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 I, what I hear you both saying is that uh, the Bible uh, giving us the four Gospels allows us to have our cake and eat it. So you want the Last Supper to be a Passover meal, you read Mark and it's a Passover meal. You want to think of Jesus' uh, death on the cross as, uh, you know, the slaughter of the Passover lamb, um, then the Passover took uh, place the following day. So the, although historically this is impossible, theologically you can have both. Yes, and it basically is the, the four Gospels is God's way of saying to you, Charlie, you're asking the wrong question. <laughs> you, you know. Oh, that's never happened. Oh, come on. <laughs> but, but as in, and, and that's one of the problems. There, there are no wrong questions. I, no I, al I always tell my students. <laughs> well, indeed, but uh, absolutely. But I suppose the issue is we can often bring questions to the scriptures that they are not actually that interested in answering. Mm. Uh, and that's a problem. And you see that across all of human, uh, you know, Christian history is w there are some things we would love the scriptures to be more clear on. But they're not. Yeah, it, yeah, I mean, it was interesting uh, reading the article that you mentioned. Mm. Um, uh, and... Uh, so Helen Bond kind of lists uh, a number of different uh, uh, scholars, you know, people like James Dunn and so on. They, they all agree it was the 30th of April, yeah. uh, uh, th the year 30, so a very, very precise date. Uh, and these are not, I mean, these are main uh, big, big names. Uh, but yeah, there, there, is this, uh, there, there is this kind of uh, desire in us to pinpoint and, and be very precise uh, about those sort of things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We can be a little bit... One of the reasons where the precision comes in is you've used astronomy, isn't it? It's, yeah. the, it's the combination of Passover, which has to have a full moon, and the date of the Sabbath. Uh, and so, you, you, so you, you, you get some precision by working out when Sabbaths and the full moons fit together. But otherwise, yeah. But even then, you know, was it Thursday or Friday? Uh, absolutely, and then you're, you're stuck again. Yeah. Anyway, shall we, shall we move to the resurrection and uh, tackle another uh, well-known problem? Yeah, uh, yeah, the, the lack thereof, really, of the resurrection in, in Mark's gospel. Exactly, yeah, which is why we've kind of called this uh, lost endings in new beginnings. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so with Mark's gospel, we just... We we get to the end, the woman go to the tomb, but Jesus isn't there. There's just a young man in the tomb. He says, go tell Peter um, that Jesus will go before them into Galilee, but the woman don't do anything with this. They just um, run away afraid. And the question we have really is, um, has an ending been lost? Did the evangelist write something more or did the evangelist... Um, choose to to end it here you know has this been put on a bookshelf somewhere this this codex and it's just wrapped away fallen off or or did he very deliberately try and um end in this way to to make a point that, that has been running throughout the gospel um so do you have any sense what which one would you go for i personally think he mark deliberately um ended here it fits in with his um, characterization of, of disciples. Um, disciples throughout the gospel um, don't understand, they're fearful. Um, and this is the male disciples. We then get to the end, and in many ways we have female disciples being introduced here. They've been given a task to do, and like their male counterparts, they, um, they, they fail to do it. Um, and in this sense, it's um, the original sort of audience of the gospel that was hearing it, um, they, they're being invited to... Um, think about themselves as disciples and, and to learn from what um, what Jesus' original disciples did or, or didn't do. And um, so it, it's sort of pedagogical in, in that way that, that Mark has. But wouldn't that make the gospel too much about the disciples and not about Jesus? But that's, that Jesus isn't reading it, is he? The gospels are re read by Christian disciples. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they're, 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 the, they're, they're the people who... Who, they're the people that gospel writers is trying to impact on. Mm. Um, and, but I think it, it raises the question, because I agree completely with Elizabeth, but it raises the question about the gospel form. 
that I think our problem is once you have Matthew and Luke and John, you think, but a gospel must have the resurrection appearances. Yeah. Um, similarly, we find Mark troubling because he doesn't have uh, infancy narratives. Now, I know John doesn't, but he has this sort of prologue about, you know, in the beginning was the word. And so Mark seems odd as a gospel because it doesn't have the infancy and it doesn't have the resurrection appearances. But if Mark is written first, it's not odd at all. You know, no, 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 there, there wasn't a thing of what a gospel was and Mark was deliberately not doing it. Um, Mark was writing a message to um, impact on the Christian disciples in his day. And the impact is it's not all rounded off and sorted. You can go back to sleep. The impact is Jesus will go ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. And if you people hearing this story read to you in Naples in 68 AD, mm. it, if you're as hopeless as many disciples, the whole thing is going to fall apart. So it puts an onus on the, the person hearing the story. Um, we have been told that Jesus will go ahead and into Galilee. We have Jesus himself said, um, you know, I will meet you again. So we've had those hints, but you, the reader or the hearer of the gospel has to grab it and make it their own. It isn't mm -hmm. all packaged away happily ever after at the end. But, I mean, it, it is an odd ending if, if you go down that line. Because if I just read the, the, the last verse, this, this would have been the original ending then. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the angel is talking to the women. Um, and uh, he says, uh, go tell his disciples and Peter uh, that uh, he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So mm -hmm. that's kind of a nice, a mm -hmm. bit, you know, forward-looking uh, statement. Um, and then it says, so they went out, uh, and this, these are the women, not the disciples, and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So it's not even actually the disciples themselves, it's the women who are usually much more p positively portrayed, I think. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's kind of a, if you compare that, for example, to the ending of Jonah, where Jonah complains about God sparing the the Assyrians in Nineveh and so on. And God uh, does all these wonderful practical jokes on him. And uh, uh, Jonah uh, complains the, uh, again. And God says to him, well, you complain about this plant. Uh, should I not have spared the city of Nineveh, which has so many people and, and cattle and so on? There is this question. The book ends with the question. And so the Israelite audience can read it and, and can hear the question addressed to themselves. And both the opportunity to answer, to respond negatively and positively are there because it's, it's an open ending. This one seems to shut things down. You know, they went, they said nothing to anyone. They were afraid, full stop. Yes, but no, I think it's that, okay, you're, you're listening to this gospel being read. Are you going to be um, filled with amazement uh, at what you're reading and what's happening? And what are you going to do now? Are you going to be filled with terror and leave and not do anything about it? Or are you going to embrace being a disciple of Jesus and, and be better than, than the, the original disciple? Absolutely. You just don't want happy endings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've but, watched too many Disney movies. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but, so, so, I mean, I agree with you. It is deeply shocking. And that is why in the first 100, 200 years, other endings were added on. Absolutely. Yeah. Because... Exactly like we won't depict Jesus on a cross naked. It's too shocking. We won't have the ending of a gospel being said nothing to no one because they're afraid. It's too shocking. Um, but um, whether I, I wouldn't have been brave enough to write it like that, and lots of us might hide, but actually Mark saying, no, no, the last words you hear when it's being read in, 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 your, um, in your basement on Alexandria um, um, for fear of the Roman authorities, and this is read out, and you, you see this and you think, yes, we've got there, the resurrection. They said nothing to no one because they were afraid. I always imagine the lights then come up and, you know, Peter walks on stage and says, so what are you going to do? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hitting stuff. It's hard hitting. Mm -hmm. And this is interesting, actually, because I'm thinking, you know, they... 
they had this opportunity and for for going and taking this message and uh, the, the woman had this opportunity to take this message and so the gospel being written um for an audience who are, who are being also being encouraged no you go out and take this message um off jesus like like remain in this amazement that you have but don't be in fear actually go go and do it and i think this ties in with um sort of resurrection accounts we see in matthew and john um we do have a a mission element um in in those gospels Absolutely, he doesn't look persuaded, but it does. It does work because it works with what you have with characterization of the disciples and the rest of Mark. That Mark tends to be quite um, blunt and revealing their failures. As we move into other gospels, they turn a little bit more into the stained glass window figures. Hmm. But Mark, all the way through, seems to be about not making you think it was okay for them. They were the heroes of faith. What can I do? He almost de- deliberately makes you realize, no, no, you may feel frightened and hopeless. Yeah, Peter was as well. Yeah, the women were as well. So I think it ties in as he, he, he very much avoids depicting the people in the Bible story as heroes who had it sorted. You know, we can like that, we cannot like it, but it's a consistent theme to do exactly what Elizabeth says, so to make you think, oh, all right, okay, I... I, I God needs me then, you know? He doesn't just need the heroes who get it right. And if they, if none of them have said anything, well, maybe I need to. Mm-hmm. Of course, the people hearing it in the, in the basement in Alexandria, they did know that the women have actually told because the story has, has come to them, hasn't it? Well, now, now you're speculating. You're... Well, no, but they've heard the Christian message. They know people. They know that wasn't the end of the story, don't they? Yeah. Because otherwise, yeah. how has the Christian message come to them? So it's not as if this is being read by an alien who, who thinks, oh, right, so no one ever heard any of this, did they? I mean, clearly they know somehow it got out. And they, you know, in that sense, they know that someone in the story overcame their fear yeah. and started to tell. Uh, and in a sense, the Orden is left in thinking, well, I'm frightened like they were. I'm really pleased they finally overcome their fear and told. Otherwise, the message wouldn't have reached me. Maybe I need to overcome my fear and mm. tell as well. Yeah. So in that, <clears throat> in that sense, uh, maybe the more overt mission elements that you pointed to in, mm. in, in John and uh, Matthew are, again, as with the glory uh, theme, they are kind of bringing out stuff that is implicit in Mark. Um, and kind of making it a bit more um, explicit in their endings. Yeah. I mean, I think John especially, he... I mean, we see that um, sort of rehabilitation of of Peter in in chapter 21, and Mm -hmm. Peter's among those disciples who, you know, Jesus says in in 20, you know, as I have been sent, um, so I send you. So they... um, John in some ways is trying to to sort of bring Peter back into the story, bring him back as a, as a positive um, figure there, in some ways maybe correcting in some ways what, um, what, what Mark had done. But. And I, I, I think that's right. What's interesting is there's a lot of church tradition about Peter being the origin of Mark's gospel um, and, and different ways of understanding that. And I've written about that, about, about sort of Peter, sort of, Mark having, in a sense, written, written down Peter's preaching as the, the old church tradition. And that actually makes some sense of this, because most of us are more honest about our own failings than we would feel able to about other people. Yeah. So there's something, so I, I think Elizabeth's right, in the, depic, you know, the difference John is rehabilitating, and you can almost imagine that Peter being very, very avoiding any sense that he's the hero gives you Mark's gospel. And then others are then saying, oh, no, come on, but Peter, you turned out well. Come on, don't be so down on yourself. And are then people who are, who are rehabilitating. And, and yeah. I think I mean, you can't prove that happened, but it, it, it makes some f- connections with the story of, of, of Peter standing behind Mark's gospel. Yeah, it so certainly turn, <clears throat> turns Peter into a more attractive figure, if that is um, historically how it went, a humble one. And, and particularly for our, our age, where we're quite suspicious of, of heroes 
on pedestals being presented as being all perfect, which might be a bit more of a Victorian thing isn't it? Well, we, we tend to be more suspicious. We think, oh, I'm sure they weren't that perfect. Uh, and we like authenticity, don't we? Yeah. We, we want the, And we're more forgiving of weakness because we... But we also want... We want the authenticity of people being honest about the strengths and weaknesses. So to wrap things up, I, I thought we maybe we can uh, focus on one final uh, detail. Uh, uh, the Walking Dead in Matthew. Mm. Uh, I don't know if any of you are, uh, are. Are you a fan of The Walking Dead or zombie movies? <laughs> oh, I've watched a few in the past, but um... I'm I'm not particularly great uh, admirer of zombies. Uh, I find them a bit repelling, but I, I like <laughs> The Walking Dead uh, for other reasons. Uh, but we we do have so the we, we do have uh, Jesus raises uh, is raised from the dead at the end of the gospels but in Matthew we have a bunch of other people who kind of yeah. uh, break from the tombs and funnily enough not actually during the resurrection but during the the death of Jesus so the tombs open and these guys uh, come out of the tombs and they walk around and that's all we hear in Matthew and we hear nothing else uh, anywhere else and you read that passage and you think, what on earth is going on here? What happened to these people? Did they die again? Were they taken up to heaven? Uh, what is the point of these people uh, walking around uh, Jerusalem and, and appearing to, to others? Absolutely. Of course, you do have uh, Lazarus, who's raised from the dead in, in John, and the, the son of the widow is raised from the dead in Luke, isn't he? So I agree with you, this is a very strange passage. But it is interesting, actually, the idea that in connection with Jesus' ministry, each of the Gospels, other than Mark, has a story of the dead being raised. Um, I'm not sure that makes it any easier, but it, but it is interesting. So though the, 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 the idea of it, the timing element there, the, the crucifixion is unique to Matthew. Um, dead people being raised, and, I, and again, you know, did Lazarus die? Did Lazarus die again? I suppose most of us assume he, he did. That this is a sort of, um, 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 uh, but as you brought out, actually, even on the timing, this isn't timing the Jesus resurrection. It, it's it, it, which seems to me it put it does put it in a different box. Then they're not the start of the mm. the, the the new world. It's it, it is more. If in my mind, it's more similar to. The, the, the people coming back from the dead during Jesus' ministry. Um, they're not sharing in Jesus' resurrection. Although, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure, <clears throat> I'm sure they're not because it's it's not the same as the resurrection at the end, uh, uh, at the end of the age. But you, you could read it almost as uh, tying the resurrection and, and the cross a bit more closely. So mm -hmm. it's almost like Matthew is saying. In the very moment when Jesus uh, experiences death, actually life uh, comes back in. And so death and li <laughs> life uh, are brought much more forcefully together by, by, by that event. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I think we see that in John, back to Lazarus. He, they, um, Jesus, by raising Lazarus, so that that's the act that leads to, to his death. So sort of by giving life, Jesus has to give up his life. And it is here again, Jesus gives up his life in Matthew and, and others get given life. They, they come out of, of the tombs. But I think what's so fascinating in Matthew is we, we're not told how long these people have been dead for. You know, at least in the other Gospels, we get a sense. I know we're told that Lazarus is a bit stinky after four <laughs> days. But here we're just like, we, we don't know how many, how long these these folks have been dead and buried. And I think it's that sort of, um, this history of faithful Israelites, like what, 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 what is it that we're, we're meant to sort of understand from, from this? Maybe yeah. Amos was, was raised from the exactly, dead. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's funny then, because if you, if you push the sort of question, well, do you think it happened or not? You, you're left, I think you have to be honest, none of us have any way of assessing that question. You know, completely understandable why more skeptical friends would say, but surely isn't it just being told to make a certain point? Mm. Well, I, I, absolutely. I, I don't deny it ties in with that point. But whether you've just got no, when you've just got a single story like that, you, 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 there's nothing you can say, is there? As, you know, Matthew says this, 
you can't assess it. All you can say is Matthew says it, can't you? And you can see connections that, you know, Matthew might be making. But even that, it does, that doesn't prove whether he's made it up or whether he's seeing connections and something that happened. You're, you're sort of stuck, aren't you? Um, but the other thing I was thinking when, when you were speaking there was that sense of, we said earlier about time, and time isn't the question that the gospel writers wanted to ask, answer in terms of the timing of the Jesus' mm-hmm. death. But also here, the death and the resurrection are, we'll often you know, want to address as separate things. But where we started with John's gospel is all about, well, you might think, oh, the cross was the bad news and the resurrection is Jesus' glory, but John is bringing them together. And so almost the separation of, of a sort of chronology between crucifixion and resurrection is something that seems obvious to us. Uh, and, you know, there's a, a sort of, well, 48-hour period, slightly less than that. But I think, as you're saying, the gospel word, is, it's all being merged together in a sense, isn't it? Because the, the meaning of the two can't be distinguished. And it's the meaning that matters more than quite how many hours were between one or the other. Or at least for them, the, mm-hmm. the number of hours between the two did, wasn't the point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And how long the people had been dead for didn't matter either. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. um, although it's, it's uh, up, up, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, um, is it, uh, I've just thought of a topic, is it Matthew's equivalent of the penitent, the penitent thief on the cross? You know, today you'll be with me in paradise, as in, you know, it's, it's it, it, I, I, or, or is it, you know, Amos from 800 years ago? You know, it, it's a, it, it, but it's interesting, again, he's not, he's not interested to tell us, is he? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, of course, that, it does, make you wonder doesn't it is there a message he's trying to give maybe about the power of what was going on or the anticipation of the resurrection or is it just that someone like Matthew heard this account from the people who were there and thought golly that's so important I'll shove it in even though I don't know what to make of it yeah you know what I mean we can sometimes think everything included is part of some deliberate um, strategy and maybe it is but um um, it is yeah. it is interesting that uh, when we are talking about Mark, you are arguing very strongly about an intentional, mm-hmm. if somewhat um, extraordinary ending. Um, it's almost like uh, it, it's hard to conceive that there was more to the gospel which was accidentally lost. Um, but here we are, or you are happier to think, well, maybe it was just an odd historical detail that was... Um, uh, Include it in the gospel without much uh, meaning necessarily. I, I think Jeremy could be right because, you know, this is the point now there's so much happening. Jesus has died, there's, there's an earthquake, the temple curtain is torn, and and something more miraculous happens. These people come out of the tomb, and I don't know, did, or tombs, did, did Matthew, did he really care about the historicity of it, or did he want to just really emphasize the power of what was happening at? at that moment of Jesus' death. So I think I think just as a sort of rhetorical literary device, it can almost mm-hmm. just just be there um, as well. Too. I think that's right. And, and, and I do, and I, I, I take the point, and I suppose underlying that is the, the sort of assumptions of, or assumptions, the, 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 the thoughts of biblical scholars, which is how, when you compare Mark to Matthew, Luke and John, or particularly to Matthew and Luke, it, they seem to have Matthew at Mark as the as the sort of the baseline core to yeah. which they've added other material, and so yes, I guess I'm speaking out from that tradition which says Matthew and Luke seem to have gathered more material, all the parables and whatever, yeah. and that it's a mistake to think why did Mark so did Mark not know the Lord's Prayer. It's actually the Mark is telling quite a focused story, and then Matthew and Luke um, are both trying to give a more comprehensive story. Yeah. So, so you're right. I'm I'm sort of drawing on that. It's easier for me to think of Math of Matthew and Luke trying to be comprehensive, where my image of Mark is that he's not trying to be comprehensive. Whether that's right, but I think that's right. That's a sort of a common scholarly assumption. 
um, of, of the different balance between what they're doing. And compared to John, in one sense, is, is really giving depth on a small number of, you know, the number of stories he tells is quite small, but you get a whole chapter of stuff yeah. from one story. So there's a different sort of purpose, literary design going on between them, or at least I'm working on the basis that there is. Yeah, I think, yeah. Well, that's probably a nice uh, point at which to, to wrap things up. I, one, one thing I've kind of uh, taken from this conversation is, is the question of, of asking questions. So you accuse me at the start of uh, asking the, the wrong question, uh, which is, uh, which is which it's, it's an important thing, isn't it? The, the sort of questions we ask uh, determine the way we understand things because if we never ask a question about something, then we never really... Uh, go in exploring uh, in that particular direction. So there are good and bad questions to ask, and we are, will always tend to kind of ask some of the wrong questions, if you like. Yes, and, and I'm, I should be told off as saying the wrong question, but I suppose the point is there's fruitful questions, and f there's questions that don't actually bear fruit. might be really understandable. A lot of questions in, in human lives, you know, why is this happening to me? hugely understandable, relevant question. You don't want to say people shouldn't ask it, but it may not actually get you very far. Um, and so I suppose, yes, wrong questions isn't the right phrase. I want to, I want to edit myself there. But there are, there are questions which bear fruit, aren't there? And no. there's questions which are understandable but don't get you very far. No, I think you're right. I mean, I, I do tell students there are no wrong questions to ask. Uh, but uh, I actually uh, will be the first one to admit that uh, this is true. And there are some questions that are stupid and other, <laughs> other questions are, are very good. Uh, so, yeah, it, it is a life skill, you know, learning to ask uh, the good or fruitful questions, uh, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, um, yeah, it's been great having you, yeah. Jeremy. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Coming on the podcast and... Um, uh, we will uh, look forward to talking about uh, the elements, I guess, at some point. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, well, and then until then, um, goodbye from us. Yeah, and, uh, thank you for joining us. All the best. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed our podcast, please subscribe and watch out for future episodes. If you're interested in theology, why not visit the Sid Patterns Institute website and check out our programs.